Our next keynote speaker is Mr. Richard Benecke, who is a Senior Advisor for National Space Policy in the Bureau of Arms Control Verification and Compliance at the U.S. Department of State. In his current position, Mr. Benecke advises State Department officials on the planning and implementation of diplomatic and public diplomacy activities relating to U.S. national security space. He served from June 2011 to June 2018 as the co-chair of an international expert group on space debris, space operations, and tools for collaborative space situation awareness, which was established as part of the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, working group on the long-term sustainability of outer space activities. He also serves as his Bureau's lead for U.S.-European Union exchanges and space security cooperation. Before joining the State Department, Mr. Benecke was a senior policy analyst at the Aerospace Corporation, where he served as a lead analyst for the U.S. Department of Defense's efforts related to mission assurance and resiliency of commercial space capabilities. Please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Benecke to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, and uh, aloha and uh, mahalo to the uh, uh, Maui Economic Development Board for, for organizing this, this fantastic conference, which uh, this is the first time I've been here, but uh, now I will plan on making, planning on returning as soon as I can next year. Uh, first, I also send greetings from Ken Hodgkins, who is the head of the U.S. delegation to the uh, United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Uh, which as far as I'll call copious to make it a lot quicker, uh, and uh, wanted to provide his greetings. And again, I think he'll be very jealous that he couldn't join you here today. Uh, because the space age is now in its seventh decade, there are an increasing number of anniversaries that can be commemorated. Uh, later this year, many around the world will recall the 50th anniversary of the first human circumnavigation of the moon and the memorable Christmas Eve broadcast of Earthrise by the crew of Apollo 8, an achievement which some Apollo astronauts and historians view was as significant as the Apollo 11 landing uh, seven months later. Uh, another anniversary that I'd like to note is the 60th anniversary of, the, uh, of, of Copius, the establishment of Copius. Uh, Copius was first established by a UN General Assembly resolution adopted in December of 1958, just five, 15 months after the launch of Sputnik 1 and 11 months after the launch of Explorer 1. This resolution was actively promoted by the Eisenhower administration, which was concerned that the Soviet Union had, in its words, surpassed the United States in space. In a report submitted to President Eisenhower in August of 1958, so actually just about 60 years ago, members of the National Security Council staff noted that, quote, the rapid pace of outer space achievements in the past months has aroused great interest among all UN members concerning the role of the United Nations in various aspects of outer space. The maintenance of, of US posture as the leading exponent in the use of outer space for peaceful purposes requires that the United States take an imaginative and positive position. During the committee's first ad hoc meeting in September of 1959, the United States and 12 other delegations addressed both the opportunities and challenges of the space age. In its report, the committee noted that the development of space activities is advancing at a staggering rate. As a result, the committee feels strongly that the conduct of outer space activities must be effectively open and orderly. Later this year, or later that year in 1959, uh, the United Nations General Assembly agreed to establish COPUS as a standing committee. Over the subsequent six decades, COPUS has served as an important mechanism for nations to join in cooperative efforts relating to outer space. While the focus was initially on government space programs of the United States and the then Soviet Union, uh, the committee's consensus process soon welcomed contributions from a growing number of spacefaring nations, uh, expanding from an initial 18 members to the current roster of 84 governments. The numerical expansion in the membership of COPUS has been matched, and many would argue outpaced, by advances in space technology, particularly in the commercial sector. As U.S. industry found new ways to advance the benefits of space, U.S. satellite constellations, including defense, civil, and commercial assets, have revolutionized the way we communicate, travel, farm, trade, and of course, defend our nation and our allies. At a conference like Amos, I don't need to repeat what other speakers have said far more eloquently about the impact of these changes on space situational awareness, including the, the speaker that just preceded me, Dr. Kwan. 
Discussions here this week have also considered implications of exciting new capabilities like mega constellations and satellite servicing. There have also been discussions on the challenges of potential adversaries actively develop ways to deny U.S. and allied use of critical space capabilities in a crisis or conflict. As Vice President Pence recently noted, what was once peaceful and uncontested is now crowded and adversarial. In response to these challenges, the Trump administration is moving ahead with the implementation of the president's national strategy for space. This strategy, which was approved by President Trump earlier this year, emphasizes the dynamic and cooperative interplay between the national security, commercial, and civil space sectors. It features a whole of government approach that is implemented in close partnership with the private sector and in concert with our allies. It, this will be particularly essential for efforts to ensure effective space uh, operations through improved space situational awareness, as well as cooperation with allies to determine cooperative threat responses. The National Strategy for Space also puts forward a reinvigorated approach to ensuring U.S. leadership and success in space. As pre at the same time, and as President Trump noted at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland uh, earlier this year, America first does not mean America alone. This strategy not only seeks to advance the benefits of space for ourselves, but also to ensure that our nations can benefit from the peaceful exploration and use of outer space. In this regard, COPUS will continue to remain the key multilateral forum for fostering conducive environments that strengthen the stability, safety, and sustainability of our space activities. The committee's work in support of our current international government's framework for space activities is underpinned by the Outer Space Treaty, three other treaties, and five voluntary, non-legally binding UN agreements, including a set of voluntary guidelines for space debris mitigation. Building on the results of those voluntary guidelines for space debris mitigation, which were approved in 2007, uh, then copious chairman Gerard Brachet of France proposed to establish a working group on the long-term sustainability of outer space activities, or LTS. The United States supported the creation of the group in 2010, in the selection of Dr. Peter Martinez of South Africa as the working group's chair. Over the past eight years, copious exchanges took place in three phases in Vienna. Over the first period, technical experts and diplomats from more than two dozen countries worked constructively to advance the shared interest and responsibility of all spacefaring nations to create conditions for the safe, stable, and operationally sustainable space environment. In the first phase, during the working group's you know, year from 2010 to 2011, um, involved procedural negotiations on terms of reference. This resulted in the establishment of a framework that allowed the direct involvement of the commercial space sector, which the United States argued successfully was essential in light of commercial capabilities and expertise. There was widespread agreement among the Western group and many other delegations from, from developing nations that a set of guidelines which provided a framework for private sector contributions would be key to ensuring the long-term sustainability of space for all spacefaring nations, both public sector as well as private sector. The second phase, which ran from 2012 to 2014, uh, centered on detailed studies of four expert groups. One of these groups on space debris, space operations, and tools for collaborative space situation awareness produced a 27-page report with eight recommendations on specific guidelines for improved collision avoidance and international information sharing. This group, which I was privileged to co-chair with Claudio Partelli of Italy, included 70 technical experts from 23 UN member states, as well as three international intergovernmental organizations. The group particularly benefited from extensive inputs from a number of US and allied industry groups and technical societies. The third phase of the LTS effort was originally intended to run for two years, from 2015 to 2016. Given the dual-use character of many aspects of LTS, this phase involved, unfortunately, fewer engineers and more diplomats. Uh, during this phase, I say that as a lapsed engineer, um, during this phase, the LTS working group also had to address complex proposals by Russia, Iran, and the committee's Latin American group that were provided after the conclusion of the more technically focused expert groups in 2014. Given the complexity of some of the proposals, particularly the ones submitted by Russia, uh, it wasn't possible for the LTS working group to complete its work in 2016. So in order to provide an adequate review of all of the proposals that the group's, um, the group's mandate was extended uh, to 2016 for an additional two years, 
with the goal of issuing a compendium of guidelines that could be adopted in June of 2018 and forwarded to the UN General Assembly for, enforce, uh, for endorsement. Over this period, delegations from a wide range of UN member states worked constructively to bridge gaps and reach consensus on additional guidelines. I also should commend you know, Dr. Martinez of South Africa for his extensive dedication and patience in moving this, this very complicated process forward, uh, which, which was essential in, in the progress that we did make. By February of 2018, the working group had reached consensus on a total of 21 guidelines and the text of a preamble that provided political context. In June, this past June, this, at the 60th section of COPIUS endorsed the pre preamble text and 21 LTS guidelines agreed to at the uh, previous 55th session of the COPIUS Scientific and Technical Subcommittee. The US and our allies also supported uh, Dr. Martinez as the chair's plans to send this consensus material to the UN General Assembly for endorsement. However, Russia, single-handedly blocked consensus in both the working group and committee on endorsement of the working group report and the referral of the preamble and guidelines to the United Nations General Assembly in New York for endorsement. In justifying its obstructionism, Russia insisted that the LTS working group should negotiate disarmament-motivated proposals, which the United States and many other delegations have long argued should be addressed in other forums including the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva and the UN Disarmament Commission in New York. For those of us who have spent eight years working diligently on the LTS, this Russian attempt to politicize a well-regarded international effort by, in a sense, taking it hostage to rewrite an understanding of, of COPUS is obviously disappointing. At the same time, our dismay over Russia's recent instructionism, obstructionism and revisionism in Vienna is tempered by our confidence that the efforts of the LTS working group can provide valuable building blocks for future co uh, cooperation on space sustainability with the broader international community. In particular, the United States can join with other like-minded nations, including many in the room today, next February at the next meeting of COPUS at the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee to, to uh, describe the progress that our government and commercial sectors have made in implementing the 21 LTS guidelines agreed this past February. In discussing our efforts to enhance sustainability, the U.S. delegation and allied delegations can also cite ongoing, well, the U.S. particularly can sign ongoing work in implementing the President's Space Policy Directive on National Space Traffic Management Policy. It is particularly worth noting that SPD 3 states that the United States should encourage the adoption of new norms of behavior and best practices for space operations by the international community through bilateral and multilateral discussions with other spacefaring nations and through U.S. participation in various organizations, including COPUS as well as technical fora like the International Organization for Standards. As Kevin O'Connell noted yesterday, the Office of Space Commerce in the U.S. Department of Commerce is now engaging with the U.S. commercial sector and academia as part of its efforts to establish an open architecture SSA data repository. In parallel, the Department of State is coordinating complementary whole of government consultations with governments of allies and partners on SSA and SDM cooperation. And I note that many of these consultations actually occurred this week here in Maui, and we, we are grateful again for the opportunity to, to really have a good discussion on SPD3 and its implications. These outreach efforts will include important contributions for the Department of Defense and Transportation, and we'll we will also continue to consult with industry and allies about the national security and space transportation related aspects of SSA and STM. In concluding, once, let me once again express my appreciation to the Maui Economic Development Board and many of you. For those of us whose idea of a cutting edge application at the State Department is merge changes in Microsoft Word, uh, <laughs> which is how this speech was produced, uh, <laughs> conferences like this are particularly valuable opportunities to gain insights on, on key challenges and how governments intend to respond to those challenges. Today, I hope I've provided a sense of the breadth of the U.S. government's approach, including our new national space strategy, our support, con con continued support of uh, international efforts, and our close cooperation with allies, uh, and a strong partnership with the commercial sector, as well as the overall policy direction that we have regarding space traffic management. As Vice President Pence noted, while other nations increasingly poss possess the capability to operate in space, not all of them sh share our commitment to freedom, to private property and the rule of law. 
So as we continue to carry American leadership in space, we also will continue to carry America's commitment to freedom in this new frontier. Mahalo.